May I, as I say, express a very warm welcome to you all on behalf of the International House Council. Uh, this is a very uh, important event in the calendar of the International House activities and uh, we're delighted to see so many people here <coughs> indeed. And uh, we do, we do uh, have uh, many distinguished guests and indeed to all of you uh, we see you all as distinguished but if I may uh, uh, <laughs> indeed uh, say of course, of course. Uh, that we, we do indeed have the Deputy Chancellor uh, with, with <coughs> us uh, uh, here this evening. Uh, Robert Johansson is here. Uh, the Consul General of India from Sydney uh, here, uh, uh, Arun Kumar Goyal, is, is here with us and we're delighted. The, indeed, the Acting Consul uh, General of India in, in uh, Melbourne here is also uh, Raj Kumar, uh, is with us as well. Uh, we, we have uh, the Dean of the Faculty of of business and economics here, uh, and uh, of course my fellow fellows of International House Council and a number of council members, so it's a delight to be here. I, I guess you're all well aware that uh, International House is one of the colleges of the University of Melbourne. In, indeed, it, it's the one college that the university actually owns uh, as such. and. Uh, at any one time, of course, we, we do have a, a community of about 300 people on site. We, we, we have some 270 students, uh, a great diversity. We, uh, the college was founded more, more than uh, uh, 50 years ago. Uh, Elizabeth, please, please come forward. We just, I, I just uh, advise that you were delayed, but, but no? All right. <laughs> But the, the college was founded more than 50 years ago, uh, but the, the, two, the 300 uh, uh, people we, we have on site of any one time, uh, we pride ourselves in, in having cultural diversity, but uh, we equally aim to, to, to have between 40-50% Australian students, which is something that people don't always recognise, and, and another, uh, the balance being international students. A uh, very good reason for that, because the college was founded to, to build uh, understanding international understanding between Australians and, and uh, students from overseas and be, of course between students uh, from various countries themselves and, and at any one time uh, typically we have students from more than 30 countries living and eating together sharing playing sport uh, culture and all of that which is a very important part of what we do. I mean, the other thing uh, I, I should say is, is uh, th this uh, is a landmark uh, year for, for the college because uh, the university uh, has agreed that we should construct a new building here. Uh, council approvals have been given both University Council and Melbourne City Council now and uh, we are about to commence uh, subject to all the tenders coming in on reasonably priced uh, a new building uh, to, to the south uh, we, which is an amenity for the entire college uh, it will have uh, 30, 57 new rooms, but it will also have a whole lot of other meeting spaces. Uh, and and it's, it's in a way response, in response to the Melbourne academic agenda, where indeed we, we are seeing more graduate students, as you know, coming to the university, indeed wanting to come to the college, age older profile, have a higher expectation in terms of the environment in which they live. And, and so in fact, uh, that's an exciting development. I'd, not going to say much about it tonight, but, but you will, you will not out here about it in, in due course, and, and uh, uh, that I think, as well as uh, maintaining all the other activities the college do, uh, does from time to time, uh, uh, will, will be a major uh, activity for the, the International House Council. But the other thing we do is, is as I mentioned, we've got uh, alumni spreading back more than 50 years now, and uh, maintaining a linkage with alumni and friends building uh, and providing, if you like, uh, services and uh, in fact participating in events such as this one uh, is an important thing we do uh, for, for our alumni and friends. And so it, it really is uh, 
uh, delight to have with us uh, tonight uh, as our most distinguished guest uh, this evening is, is, is indeed the International House Orator, which is uh, Saul Eslake. Uh, Saul, I, I think, is probably known one way or another, Saul, to pretty well everybody here. Uh, he indeed is a very distinguished economist, has, has worked really in financial markets uh, here now for more than 25 years, uh, had, had many roles. Uh, there and, and currently he's uh, in fact is the chief economist for the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Australia, uh, and commenced that in December 2011. But before that uh, he had an interlude, I think, uh, two years where he went to our own Grattan Institute as a think tank uh, uh, body that we have and he was working on uh, uh, productivity growth growth program for the Grattan Institute. So, so Saul's already had uh, a significant uh, link in that sense to the university. He has several directorships. Uh, I think Saul probably your roots uh, are still pretty firmly in Tasmania, indeed, uh, because that's where he started. Uh, first class honours, uh, which won't surprise anybody, I'm sure, in economics at the University of Tasmania. He has a graduate diploma in applied finance and investment from the Securities Institute. Uh, he's been awarded a, an honorary LLD by the University of Tasmania, uh, very appropriately, uh, no doubt. He has, a, has the senior executive program at Columbia University. And uh, as we all know, he's uh, a very active uh, journalist uh, writing on economic uh, affairs. And so we were delighted that Saul uh, agreed to accept our invitation to be the International Affairs Orator, or, or orator for this year. And, and indeed the topic, uh, which is entitled Australia's Economic Relationship with India, uh, could not be more timely, I think, for, and especially for someone who has that wonderful insight into the Australian economy. But equally, uh, we all know that we're, we're part of a global enterprise now and, and nothing more important uh, looking forward uh, to, to indeed uh, strengthen our relationship with India. So I'd like to invite uh, the uh, 2013 uh, International Affairs or Orator to, to deliver the address, Sol S. Lake. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Larkins for that very generous introduction and um, to you and to Professor Jane Munro, uh, to Sir Ninian and Lady Stephen, former Governor General, uh, Chancellor Elizabeth Alexander, to Arun Kumar Gaul and Raj Kumar as representatives of the government and people of India, other distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. I have to say at the outset that I feel very honoured to have been invited to give this 2013 International House Annual International Affairs Oration. As I understand it from prior conversations with Professor Larkins, it was prompted by an op-ed piece that I was invited to write for The Age, I think in October last year, ahead of a visit by Prime Minister Gillard to India her first visit to India, and to reflect in less than 800 words on the state of Australia's relationships with India. And that was, I think, the, uh, the genesis of the invitation for me to speak here tonight. At the risk, which I hope is only a small one, of undermining the credibility of everything else I intend to say this evening, I have to confess that although I've been to many countries in Asia over the course of my life, including at least five times that I can recall to China and many more to Japan, Indonesia, Singapore and Malaysia, I've never actually been to India. <laughs> that means that in order to discharge the obligations that I took on in accepting this invitation tonight, I had to do a fair bit of work in improving my understanding of <laughs> India's economy because it seems to me that the fact that I've never been to India is something I share with a considerable number of my fellow Australians and one of the issues that afflicts Australia's relationships with India is that we actually know far less about it than we do about many other countries in the region notwithstanding that we have one or two things in common that almost every Australian citizen could cite by and large, in our political, academic and business circles, there's far less awareness of Indian history, 
Indian politics and Indian economic and strategic interests than there now is, for example, as regards our knowledge about China or Japan. And that's not to overstate the degree of knowledge or understanding within Australia's elite community about those countries either, compared with the depth of understanding, knowledge and interest that we take in more traditional partners that we have in the United States and Europe. Since it began opening up to the rest of the world in 1991, India's economy has grown at an average annual rate of six and three quarters percent. That's propelled it from the ninth largest economy as it was when the reform era began in 1991, to now being the third largest in the world, using the same measuring stick that by which China's economy now ranks as the world's second largest. The, Asian, the Australian government's Asian Century White Paper, published in October last year, projects that India's economy will continue to grow at this six and three quarters percent annual rate at least through 2025, whereas China's growth rate is forecast to slow to 7% per annum over this period from an average of just over 10% per annum over the past two decades. Looking out a little longer than this, the OECD projects that India's economy will grow at an average annual rate of 4.9% through to 2060, a percentage point faster than China's forecast growth rate over the same period. If that turns out to be correct, then sometime between 2045 and 2060, India's economy will move past that of the United States to be the world's second largest after China's, which is set to overtake America's by 2017, according to the IMF's most recent set of forecasts. Importantly, however, India's longer term growth prospects owe more to demography than most of most other countries. According to the OECD projections from which I've just quoted, population growth will contribute 1.1 percentage points per annum to India's economic growth rate over the next five decades. That's a higher figure than for any of the other 41 developed and emerging countries for which the OECD has made these projections, other than, ironically in view of their other differences, Israel and Saudi Arabia. It's in particular in marked contrast to China, where demography will detract from growth by a greater margin than for any other important country except for Russia. There are a number of well-known downsides to a declining and rapidly aging population, particularly for a country which has yet to build up adequate means of providing for retirement incomes and for health and aged care needs. And indeed, that's one of the biggest challenges that faces China over the next 20 years. But the larger than average contribution which population growth will be making to India's economic growth over the next 40 or 50 years also means that economic growth on its own won't translate into improvements in average li living standards as rapidly as they will in other countries. Hence, for example, although India's real GDP will grow by 1.1 percentage point per annum faster than China's, between 2011 and 2060, according to the OECD's projections. India's per capita GDP growth rate will only be 0.2 percentage points higher than China's over this period. That is, even when India becomes the second largest economy in the world, India's people will still be among the poorest in the world on average. If the OECD's forecasts turn out to be precisely correct, then India's economy, which last year was 35% of America's and 38% of China's measured by the absolute value of GDP, will by 2060 be 38% larger than America's and two thirds the size of China's. But India's per capita GDP, which is a widely accepted, if incomplete and imperfect measure of average economic well-being, will still be 52% lower than China's which is not much improvement over last year when India's per capita GDP was 57% below China's. And while material living standards are by no means the be all and end all of well-being, a point that's been elegantly stated by the Nobel Prize winning Indian economist Amartya Sen, among others, there aren't too many examples of countries with relatively low per capita GDPs who do well on other measures of well-being. As Andrew Lee, who was a professor of economics at ANU before entering parliament at the last federal election and has just been appointed parliamentary secretary to the prime minister, has put it, in countries with higher levels of GDP per capita, people are more likely to say that they experienced enjoyment, 
and more likely to say that they were pleased at having accomplished something. People in affluent nations are less likely to have experienced physical pain, loneliness, depression, and boredom. So before I talk about Australia's economic relations with India, I want to make a few observations about India's economic performance and prospects. And it's not hard to do that without making several comparisons with China, which of course Indians routinely do themselves because China is the country with which India's most commonly compared. In 1950, India's per capita GDP was 78% higher than China's. Both countries, of course, entered the post-war era bearing heavy scars. China had experienced centuries of decay under the Qing, who were foreigners to most Chinese in the same sense that the Mughals were to most Indians, followed by a half century of at various times political instability, civil war, and for 12 years being an active theater of the Second World War, during which between 15 and 20 million people are thought to have died, of whom only about two and a quarter million were military casualties. India's experience of World War II was less traumatic than China's. Apart from the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and briefly part of Nagaland in 1944, India wasn't occupied or invaded, and Indian cities weren't bombed in the way that Chinese cities most seriously were. Some two and a half million Indians nonetheless served with allied military forces, of whom 35,000 lost their lives. And it's thought that between one and a half and four million Indian civilians died in Bengal in 1943, in part as a result of British policies intended to deny Japanese forces access to food supplies in the event that they actually did succeed in invading that part of India. Immediately after World War II, India was of course also emerging from nearly three and a half centuries of British rule and from the trauma of partition with Pakistan. Nonetheless, according to the best available estimates, China's per capita real GDP was 18% lower in 1950 than it had been in 1900, while India's was 3% higher than it had been at the beginning of the 20th century. So China arguably had more catching up to do than India did halfway through the 20th century. Still, it wasn't until 1984 that China's per capita GDP exceeded India's for the first time since 1850. By 2001, China's per capita GDP was 50% higher than India's. By 2007, it was double India's. And last year, China's per capita GDP was 130% higher than India's. The Australian Treasury's constructed a framework for analysing long-term economic growth rates, which it's used in the three intergenerational reports published since 2001, and which has since come to be known as the Three P's framework, because it posits that real economic growth, or GDP growth, ultimately comes from three sources, population, participation in the labour force, and productivity. The same framework can be used to show the contributions of labour force participation and productivity growth to the long-term growth rate of per capita real GDP. Applied to a comparison of India's per capita real GDP growth with China's, what this shows is first that India has been much less successful at lifting labour force participation than China. Since 1960, employment as a percentage of India's population has risen from 37.7% to 40.1%, an increase of just 2.4 percentage points. Whereas in China over the same period, employment as a percentage of the population has risen from 45.8%, i.e. it was higher 50 years ago in China than it is today in India, to 56.6% in 2012, an increase of almost 10 percentage points. Second, India has been much less successful at improving labour productivity growth. Average annual growth in output per person employed in India has increased from 1.4% per annum in the 60s and 70s to 5.1% per annum so far in the 21st century. On its own, that's an impressive performance. But in China, productivity growth has risen from 2% per annum during the 60s and 70s to 10.4% per annum over the past 12 years. So this prompts the obvious question, which Indians continue to ask themselves. Why has India performed so poorly on both of these critical drivers of long-term economic growth relative to its principal comparator? 
A growing number of people, especially I suspect business people, would answer this question by pointing to politics. And specifically that India has since 1947 had a democratic political system in which governments have had to submit themselves to the judgment of the people at regular intervals. Whereas China has since 1949 been a one-party state in which political leaders don't have to worry about the possibility of losing office if their policies are temporarily unpopular. Although I readily acknowledge that a number of countries, principally in East Asia, have made enormous economic advances under political systems that are often referred to as benign dictatorships, there are at least as many examples, including some in East Asia, where dictatorship has been neither benign nor, especially in Africa and the Middle East, particularly conducive towards sustaining strong economic growth over long periods of time. And in fact, formal statistical investigations have consistently refuted the suggestion that democracy is bad for economic growth. As a more practical matter, I'd observe that the East Asian countries which appear to have sustained rapid rates of economic growth over long periods under what could arguably be called benign dictatorships have generally had high degrees of racial or ethnic homogeneity, very little religious diversity, and a very strong national identity. By contrast, India is an incredibly diverse country, ethnically, religiously, culturally, linguistically, and in other ways. And I suspect that as such, the forms of benign dictatorship which may have worked in other less diverse countries probably wouldn't have been sustainable in India. And indeed, India's very brief experiment with dictatorship under Mrs Gandhi in the late 1970s suggests that the Indian people themselves wouldn't have put up with that for very long. So I hope we can put that proposition to one side. I think that India's underperformance relative to China and other emerging economies, with similar histories of colonial rule, such as Indonesia and the Philippines, Indonesia having been under Dutch rule for as long as India was under the British, and the Philippines having been under Spanish and then American rule for longer than India was under the British, can be traced to a variety of other sources. First, India hasn't done as well as others, not just China, in getting the basics of economic development right. In particular, basic education and health care. As Amartya Sen put it more than a decade ago, when China turned to marketisation in 1979, it already had a highly literate people, especially the young, with good schooling facilities across the bulk of the country. In contrast, India had a half illiterate adult population when it turned to marketisation in 1991. And the situation is not much improved today. He was writing in 1999. The health conditions in China were also much better than in India because of the social commitment of the pre-reform regime to health care as well as education. The social backwardness of India with its elitist concentration on higher education and massive neglect of school education and its substantial neglect of basic health care left that country poorly prepared for widely shared economic expansion. A harsh judgment perhaps, but made by one of India's foremost economic minds. And although India's been making progress in these areas over the past decade, it remains a long way behind. According to the most recent United Nations Human Development Report, only 62.8% of India's population aged 15 and over are literate, compared with 94% of China's, and for that matter, 93% of Indonesia's, 95% of the Philippines, and 90% of Brazil's. Fewer than 40% of India's adult population has a secondary education or higher, compared with 63% of China's, 41% of Indonesia's, 65% of the Philippines, and just under 50% of Brazil's. 34% of Indian primary school aged children fail to complete primary school, compared with virtually none of China's, 20% of Indonesia's, 24% of the Philippines, and 24% of Brazil's. India's infant mortality rate of 48 per 1,000 live births is far higher than China's, 16, Indonesia's, 27, the Philippines, 29, or Brazil's, 17. India's immunisation rates for diphtheria, tetanus and pertussis and malaria are at 83 and 74 per cent respectively, still far lower than China's, 99 per cent for both, Indonesia, 94 and 89 per cent, the Philippines, 89 and 88 per cent, and Brazil's 99 per cent for both. India has just 60 doctors for every 100,000 people, compared with 140 in China, 120 in the Philippines and 170 in Brazil. 
Although at least on this score, India is better off than Indonesia, which only has 30 doctors per 100,000 people. Second, India's economic development has been retarded by its distrust of large businesses, unless they're owned by the state, and that qualification is something to which I'll return. This hostility towards bigness in business stems in no small part from Mahatma Gandhi, who emphasised in his writings, among other things, economic self-sufficiency at the village level through small-scale cottage industries. With all the respect that's due to Gandhi for his many other achievements, he was, in my view, no better informed on economics than Mao Zedong was. And I'd note in that context that India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, had a very different view of this issue than Gandhi himself. The antipathy towards large-scale enterprises has prevented India from reaping the productivity gains that usually come with scale, especially in manufacturing, and in turn helps explain one of the more unusual features of India's economic development compared with that of other emerging and developing economies, namely the relatively small role played by manufacturing. The experience of most other emerging economies, and for that matter most of what are today classified as advanced economies when they themselves were emerging, is that it's largely through the movement of labour and capital from subsistence agriculture into manufacturing that a country achieves the productivity gains that allow a sufficient proportion of people to lift their incomes to a level above which people then start to spend a growing proportion of those incomes on services, subsequently allowing an increasing proportion of the country's workforce to move from manufacturing into the services sector. However, as an insightful paper from the OECD published in 2008 observed, India's development path appears to be somewhat unusual, as the production shift from agriculture into manufacturing has proceeded more slowly than in other countries at a similar stage of development, while that to services has proceeded more rapidly. In comparison with other large economies, its manufacturing share is only a little half, over half that of China, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, as well as Korea. End of quote. While some parts of India's services sector have done exceptionally well, communications and IT being the obvious examples. As I've already noted, that hasn't been sufficient to narrow the gap in terms of per capita incomes between China and India. Moreover, as the OECD paper goes on to note, India's revealed comparative advantage is in fact in many of the same labour and resource intensive manufacturing sectors as China's. It would seem unnecessary and suboptimal for India to pursue such a unique path of development given its potential strengths and comparative advantages. They then point out that perhaps the most dominant characteristic of India's manufacturing sector is the extraordinary small scale of establishments relative to any OECD country or other emerging countries when measured in terms of employment and output. About 87% of manufacturing and employment is in micro enterprises of less than 10 employees, a smallness of scale that's unmatched with the closest comparator being Korea where less than half of all employment is in micro-enterprises. All of this partly reflects the lingering effects of regulations that were dismantled in the 1990s, such as a licensing system that stipulated that only one major company was allowed to operate in many industries, or which reserved others to small-scale industries. But the legacy of them lives on. It also reflects the effects of other regulations. India ranks 132nd on the World Bank's assessment of 185 countries for ease of doing business in them. Below China, ranked 91st, Indonesia, 128th, and Brazil, 130th, though above the Philippines at 138th. And if it's of any comfort, countries such as Syria, Iran, Venezuela, both Congos and the Central African Republic that comes last. India ranks particularly poorly on the number of procedures, time and cost involved in starting a business. 173rd out of 185. The number or procedure, number of procedures, time and cost required to start a construction project, 182nd out of 185. The compliance burden associated with paying taxes, 152nd. And the number of procedures, cost and time involved in enforcing contracts, 184th. That is, there's only one country in the world that's worse than India on that regard, and I can't tell you which one it is. India's least worst ranking, 23rd is for obtaining credit.
In most developing countries, the movement of labour from low productivity occupations such as subsistence agriculture into higher productivity activities, whether in manufacturing or services, is, as I've said before, a substantial source of overall productivity growth and thus of sustainable increases in national income. In India, however, Labour is highly immobile across states in India as a whole, with, according to the OECD, almost half of the migrants across states being women moving for marriage, while less than 10% move to find employment. And while you might object that India's plethora of languages and dialects makes internal migration much more difficult than in, say, China, which may be true, another study finds that over the 10 years to 2005 there was twice as much migration within Europe that has the same problem, as within India. Third, although India's refreshingly free of discrimination on the basis of religion, it nonetheless wastes an enormous amount of its human capital through discrimination on the basis of gender and caste, and out of a well-meaning desire to offset some of the consequences of the latter type of discrimination through reverse discrimination in public sector employment. According again to the UN's Human Development Report, India ranks 132nd on an index of gender inequality, well behind China, 35th, the Philippines, 77th, Brazil, 85th, and Indonesia, 106th. For a country in which women have, from time to time, including at present, played a reasonably prominent role in the political system, it must surely be disappointing to be keeping company with such paragons of women's rights as Iran, 107, Sudan, 129, the Congo, 132nd, and Saudi Arabia, 145th. India scores particularly poorly when it comes to women's education. According to the 2011 census, only 65.5% of Indian women are literate compared with 82% of males, a difference of 16.5 percentage points. In China, the corresponding figures for females and males are 96% and 88%, a difference of 8 percentage points. Only 26.6% of Indian women aged 25 and older have completed at least a secondary education, compared with 50.4% of Indian men and 54.8% of Chinese women, 66% of Filipino women, 36% of Indonesian women, and 50% of Brazilian women aged 25 and over. That's a terrible waste of human potential. So is the continued existence of discrimination on the basis of caste, even though such discrimination has been officially prohibited by India's post-independence constitutions. Fourth, India's economic development has been hampered by its suspicious attitudes towards globalisation and engagement with the global economy. While these are to some extent understandable in view of India's experience of Western imperialism and colonial rule, They've nonetheless been maintained at considerable cost to India's economic performance and the well-being of its people. And despite the fact that Indonesia and the Philippines, which as I mentioned before, had at least as long an experience of colonial rule as India, and arguably under less benign rulers than the British were, have nonetheless been able to engage more effectively with the global economy than India has been. As another of India's greatest economists, Jagdish Bhagwati, has argued, contrary to what sceptics often assert, the case for free trade is robust. It extends not just to overall prosperity, but also to distributional outcomes, which makes the free trade argument morally compelling as well. Amartya Sen, who's by no means an uncritical observer of the way the global economy works, has also written, to see globalisation as merely Western imperialism of ideas and beliefs would be a serious and costly error. In the same way that European resistance to Eastern influence would have been at the beginning of the last millennium. We cannot reverse the economic predicament of the poor across the world by withholding from them the great advantages of contemporary technology, the well-established efficiency of international trade and exchange, and the social as well as economic merits of living in an open society. Yet India remains a much smaller participant in the global economy than it should be. Despite having, as I noted at the beginning, the world's third largest economy, India is only the 19th largest merchandise exporter and the 12th largest importer. Even in the area of commercial services, which is one of India's strengths, it only ranks eighth in the world between Spain and the Netherlands. Exports account for only 23% of India's GDP, compared with 32% of China's, 28% of Indonesia's, and 35% of the Philippines. Although they've come down a long way since 1991, 
the tariffs which India imposes on imports are still considerably higher than those imposed by most other comparable countries, especially in Asia. India's average most favoured nation import tariff of 12.5% compares with 9.5% for China, 7% for Indonesia and 6% for the Philippines. Although it's lower than Brazil's 14%, not that Brazil represents any kind of aspirational benchmark for a trading nation. India's average tariff on agricultural products is a staggering 31%. And this simple average of applied tariffs becomes one of almost 45% in trade weighted terms compared with 16% for China, 8% for Indonesia, 9% for the Philippines and 10% for Brazil. It's worth remembering here that contrary to the way in which protection is commonly depicted by those clamouring for it and those in government giving it, tariffs aren't something that you make foreigners pay in order to get your, their goods into your country. They're something you make your own consumers pay in order to keep foreign goods out of your country. India's high tariffs on imports of agricultural commodities are a particularly onerous burden on India's poorest citizens, who, like the poor in every country, spend more of their income on food than much richer people in the same country. And they've helped to slow the process of moving labour and capital into higher productivity uses. This ambivalence towards engagement with the global economy extends to India's attitudes towards foreign investment. India's stock of inward foreign direct investment as at the end of 2011 was equivalent to 11% of its GDP, compared with China's 28%, Indonesia's 28%, the Philippines' 12% and Brazil's 27%. This isn't because of any want of investment opportunities in India. There are enormous investment opportunities in India. It's rather because, as the OECD noted in the most recent survey of the Indian economy, barriers to foreign direct investment in some large services sectors, notably retail, remain very high. It is encouraging and a sign of change that foreign direct investment inflows into India have picked up over the last five years and actually exceeded inflows into China as a proportion of GDP in three of the last five years. But foreign investors still aren't allowed to invest, for example, in Indian government bonds, according to the OECD. Finally, India's public sector doesn't contribute to achieving economic and social goals as effectively as it could. India has quite a large public sector by Asian standards. According to the IMF's most recent World Economic Outlook, general government spending, that is excluding state-owned enterprises, accounted for 28% of India's GDP last year, compared with less than 25% of China's, 20% of Indonesia's and 19% of the Philippines, although less than Brazil's 37%. Again, I wouldn't hold Brazil up as something to aim at in this regard. Now that wouldn't be a problem if spending of that magnitude were clearly achieving worthwhile objectives and if it were more fully paid for by government revenues. Instead, general government revenues absorbed only 19% of India's GDP last year, leaving a deficit of almost 10% of GDP, which again is very high by contemporary Asian standards. 1.3% of GDP in China, 1.6% in Indonesia, 1.9% in the Philippines. And as a result, by Asian standards, India has a very high level of public debt, and the interest on that consumes money that would be much better spent elsewhere. Much of India's public spending is misdirected if you take the view that one of the primary purposes, indeed one of the most important obligations of any government, is to look after the needs of the poorest in the community and to lay the foundations for sustained economic growth. I've already mentioned that India doesn't spend enough on education and health. Indeed, the OECD's most recent survey of India notes that only seven countries in the world have lower public outlays on health care relative to GDP than India. India has also been particularly reticent about making cash transfers to, poor pe to people below the poverty line, conditional, for example, on children going to school, which experience in Brazil and Mexico, among others, suggests can be a very effective way to assist the neediest. India's instead relied on a guarantee of 100 days per annum of government-funded work for all rural residents, a scheme which isn't restricted to the poorest and which doesn't contain any guarantee that the infrastructure funded under those schemes provides genuine benefits to the local communities. On the other hand, India spends the equivalent of 5.7% of GDP subsidising food, fertilisers, irrigation and electricity. 
Money which could be far more productively and equitably spent on health, education, infrastructure or, can, or cash transfers to the poor. And in addition, foregoes revenues equivalent to some 3% of GDP by forcing publicly owned oil and gas producers to sell their output to refiners at below market prices and holding the rate of return on state-owned enterprises below their cost of capital. In all of these cases, the benefits of that spending accrue disproportionately to households in the upper half of India's income distribution. More broadly, a surprisingly high proportion of Indi Indian industry, 20% of non-farm business sector output, remains in public sector hands. In eight industries, including shipbuilding, electric motors, stainless steel and chemicals, the public sector accounts for more than 50% of total output. Given that India is not a communist dictatorship, it's surprising that so much of the commanding heights of Indian industry remain in state hands. It's also detrimental to India's economic performance. I've spent longer than I really meant to in talking about India's economic performance, and although in much of this I may appear to have been critical of various aspects of India's economic performance, I don't want to deny the great economic and social progress that India's made over the past two decades. Rather, what I'm trying to emphasise here is that India could do even better and needs to do better if its people are to live, as Amartya Sen puts it, lives that people have reason to value. However, let me now turn to what was the advertised topic for tonight's talk, which is Australia's relationships with this rapidly changing and fascinating country. Given that India has risen from the world's ninth largest economy in 1990, to its third largest in 2012, it shouldn't come as any surprise that it's also become a much more important trading partner for Australia. It's gone from being our 17th largest export market, accounting for just 1.3% of our exports in 1990, to being our fifth largest, accounting for 5% of total exports in 2012. What is surprising is that the trading relationship between Australia and... Actually, you should go... Can you go forward again? Yeah, just another... The relationship between Australia and India remains so narrowly based. Over 83% of Australia's exports to India are accounted for by just three commodities. Coal, which alone accounts for half of our exports to India, gold, a further quarter of the total, and copper ores and concentrates. Our agricultural exports to India amounted to less than 500 million in 2011-12, less than one-tenth of the value of our agricultural exports to China. That's in part a result of the very high tariffs on imports of agricultural products in India that I mentioned before. We also sold less than $300 million worth of manufactured goods to India in 2011-12, compared with over $1.5 billion worth of manufactured exports sold to China. The relationship's also rather lopsided. We import less than $2.5 billion worth of merchandise from India in 2011-12, of which the biggest single component was actually refined petroleum, valued at $221 million. By contrast, we imported over $43 billion from China in that year. Also surprising is that the relationship's gone into reverse in recent years. Our merchandise exports to India have fallen by almost 26% between 2010 and 2012. While there are some other countries who've also bought less from us last year than they did in 2010, with no other trading partner have our exports fallen by as much over the past two years as they have to India. And our total exports in that period have risen by 7.3%. Put differently, although India's share of Australia's merchandise exports is still a lot larger than it was 22 years ago, it's actually fallen from a peak of 7.5% in 2009 to, as I mentioned a moment ago, just below 5% in 2012. Not all of these developments are, of course, of Australia's doing. Some of it's the result of lower prices, especially for coal, which, as I mentioned before, accounts for half of what we sell to India. In addition, India continues to maintain very high barriers to imports of agricultural products, which, of course, is at the expense of Indian consumers, as well as of Australian farmers, and to imports of manufactured goods. And India's economy has slowed more markedly than China's, over the last couple of years, from a China-like growth rate of 8.9% in 2010 to a rather less spectacular 5.1%, the slowest in 11 years, in 2012. However, something similar has happened to our services trade with India. Although the number of Indian tourists coming to Australia has continued to rise, it's done so at a slower rate of less than 7% per annum over the past two years 
down from an average of 13% over the preceding decade. By contrast, the number of Chinese tourists visiting India has risen by over 18% per annum over the past two years, up from an average of 14% per annum over the previous decade. And the number of Indian students undertaking higher education in Australia has fallen from nearly 28,000 in 2009 to less than 15,000 in 2011. We know that there were particular factors behind this development, and it's to be hoped that the efforts which have been made to repair the damage caused by, among other things, a spate of attacks on Indian students in Australia will bear fruit over the years ahead. At least in this case, the flow in the opposite direction hasn't experienced the same fate. It remains the case that more Australians visit India than Indians visit Australia. And over the past two years, the number of Australians visiting India has risen at an average annual rate of 13.5%, little changed from the 14% growth rate experienced over the previous decade. While some of that almost certainly represents growth in business travel to India, and another part of it return visits by people of Indian origin now residing in Australia, I think it also speaks to the continuing appeal which India's history, geography and culture have to hundreds of thousands of Australians, something which is also evident in the greater appeal of Bollywood movies to Australian as well as Indian audiences. Permanent movements of people, at least from India to Australia, if not the other way around, are also becoming an increasingly important part of the relationship between our two countries. For the past four years, India has been Australia's third largest source of migrants, after New Zealand and China, but since 2009 ahead of Britain. At the time of the last census in 2011, there were 295,362 people living in Australia who were born in India, representing 1.4% of Australia's total population. That's more than any other country except for England, 4.2%, New Zealand, 2.2%, and China, 1.5%. Of course, none of this may count for much in the absence of a strong commitment to building the relationship at the government-to-government -government level. After all, Australia still trades a lot in both goods and services with the UK, albeit much less than we used to. More Australians claim British ancestry than that of any other country. We still have the British flag in the corner of ours, and we continue to profess undying allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen. Yet as soon as you arrive at Heathrow, you're immediately reminded of precisely how much that counts with the British. <laughs> Similarly, the fact that Australia is the only country to have fought alongside the United States in every war that the Americans have engaged in since World War I counts for precisely zilch when we land at Los Angeles in getting our sugar and lamb into the American market or in the prices we pay for downloading software from Adobe or apps from Apple. It used to be that Australia and India had few interests in common apart from our membership of the British Commonwealth and our love of cricket. Over the past two decades, India's need for the resources with which our continent's been richly endowed and our shared apprehension as to some of the possible consequences of the growth of China's economic and military power exercised as it is and for the foreseeable future will be by a very different political system from the one which we share has brought our two countries closer together. We've managed to remove some of the long-standing irritants from that relationship. For example, the ludicrous position that we would sell uranium to China because it signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty even though they've breached it, not least by proliferating nuclear materials and technology to Pakistan, North Korea and possibly Iran. But until recently, we wouldn't sell uranium to India because it hadn't signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, even though it's never proliferated nuclear materials and technology to anyone. But we've continued to be unenthusiastic about India's participation in APEC, and we've not taken anything like the strategic interest in the Indian Ocean that we have in the Pacific, other than perhaps as a source for, a source of, or a place to put asylum seekers. Michael Wensley, who's now Professor of National Security at the Australian National University, captured the essence of the difficulties now facing Australia-India relations in an article he wrote just over a year ago when he was still at the Lowy Institute. He said, in many ways, engaging with a rising India presents Australia a much more complex task than emerging with a rising China. For all the opacity of its strategic culture, China's interests aren't hard to work out nor are its actions particularly hard to interpret. A powerful India may be more benign than China, or it may not, but it will be much harder to read or anticipate. And Australia will always be neither fish nor fowl for India. 
The only Western country in India's strategic orbit, it'll be moralizing or pragmatic by unpredictable turns. Ultimately then, transcending their troubled history and ill-matched personalities is more than a diplomatic challenge for Australia and India. It will be a test of character and commitment, and ultimately of understanding and adaptability on both sides. In conclusion, I'd say that's a test that both sides will need to work hard for at the level of government, at the level of business, at the level of academia, and throughout all the echelons of our societies, if we're each to pass the other's hopes and expectations. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Saul has kindly uh, agreed to answer a few questions. We do have a roving microphone, and we'd ask you to use that, please. So who would like to ask the first question? Just Robin, uh, Professor Batterham here is... Uh, we'll Uh, Robin Matterham, I'm involved in the Australia-India Strategic Research Fund. Uh, can I provoke you a little? Uh, you've given us a marvellous run through on the statistics and um, a quite truly wonderful uh, overview. Thank you for that. Um, one thing you haven't mentioned, uh, perhaps it's cultural, perhaps not, perhaps it's British heritage, perhaps not, is uh, the role of bureaucracy. Uh, I just put it to you that it's very different in terms of the scale of it in India to what I observe in Australia. Now, is that just my uh, myopia? No. Um, and again, let me emphasise that the comments I'm about to make aren't informed, as perhaps desirably they should be, by having had some personal experience of dealing with the Indian bureaucracies. But uh, I sometimes say when I'm speaking more informally about the emergence or re-emergence, as I think it's more accurately described as China and India as major players, not only in the world economy, but in the geopolitical system and framework, that uh, China and India were, up until the 1500s, or maybe the 1700s, the two biggest economies in the world, and they're reclaiming places that they'd occupied through most of human history. And that one of the reasons why India went backwards as a share of the global economy and as a power was because of their experience of British colonial rule, which I usually go on to say left India with a love of cricket and bureaucracy, some familiarity with the English language and a railway system that works some of the time, uh, but beyond that didn't do a lot for India's economy and indeed people who know far more about this than I do will also relate how India used to be in particular a major exporter of textiles and the British Raj turned it into being an importer of textiles and Lancashire wouldn't have been what it was without the way in which the British exploited, using that term if I can, free of its usual pejorative implications, um, India for that and other colonial purposes. So, uh, you know, I'm not denying the legacy of British colonialism in India. What I would say is that uh, although it's the most charitable interpretation you could put on it is that it's mixed, I think any fair observer would say it was far less malign than the legacy that the Dutch left in Indonesia or the Spanish left in the Philippines over a similar or longer period. And that's why I used Indonesia and the Philippines in particular, as well as China, as comparators for most of the statistics I made. Um, I think it's also the case that in its founding decades, Indian governments, uh, and they were all of one complexion, thought that the use of state power was a way of overcoming some of the legacies of colonial rule and restoring what they not unreasonably thought was India's rightful place in the world. And although that has now changed, you know, under the governments led in particular by uh, Manmohan Singh, or in which he was the finance minister prior to that, uh, there's been an enormous change in the way in which Indian governments think. What there hasn't been is anything like a commensurate change in the way that Indian governments act or choose not to act when perhaps they should. Uh, 
And I have no idea how long it will take to change that sort of thing. Um, it can be very difficult to change in a democracy precisely because there are so many people employed in different parts of the public sector and they have more at stake, more to lose by changing it than the broader mass of Indian people who are not employed in the public sector have to gain by changing it. It's a sort of classic political economy problem. Uh, it clearly will take strong leadership to achieve those outcomes. And as we know from our attempts to push through politically controversial reforms in this country, even with strong leadership, you're not going to achieve fundamental change unless you put in the, as Paul Keating used to say, hard, when Costello used to say, hard yards of explaining to the people over and over again why these changes are necessary. I don't know, in part because I haven't been there, the extent to which large proportions of the Indian political elite make that effort. You know, in a country the size of India, it's clearly a much bigger task than it is in Australia. Not least because you have to communicate it in so many different languages. But uh, that's an essential part of breaking down and changing the kind of things that you correctly identify are part of the reason why India's economy hasn't performed as well as it should. Questions? You, you mentioned uh, the, the, the difficulty getting into India if you're a business person, but uh, compared with China, I would suspect that I'd prefer to be in an Indian jail than a, a Chinese jail, because basically it seems to me from recent happenings and a small-scale Chinese businessman, some robber baron in China wants to take your business, he does, and puts you in pr prison. So. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I'd like to be in Indian jail, but I think I'd prefer a than, than a be in China. Um, I'd rather not have to make the comparison. Um, so personally, you may be right. Well, I don't know. I mean, India doesn't execute people, uh, whereas China executes more people than the rest of the world put together. And I don't think that's anything to be proud of. Um, and yes, you're right, there have been far more cases that we in Australia know of, of Australians, often you know, worryingly, as the father of two adopted Chinese children, Australian citizens of Chinese descent, who the Chinese state appears to regard when it suits them as being Chinese nationals rather than foreigners, and thus ineligible for consular assistance. Um, that's a worrying development in China. Um, there's less of that in India. But I have to say, harking back to my 14 years with ANZ, that there are lots of people who were working for ANZ or for Grindley's Bank at the time who feel that ANZ was the victim of hometown justice in the National Housing Bank scandal, which cost ANZ the best part of $250 million. So while it may be more difficult for individuals dealing with the Chinese justice system, and at least the Indian justice system, partly because of the British heritage, looks a lot like ours, functions in principle a lot like ours, uh, from a businessman's point of view, and you saw my figures about the difficulties in forcing contracts, and that's the sort of thing that is of concern to business people rather than necessarily, hopefully, the criminal law, um, that uh, those things appear to be much more difficult in India than in China. And I suppose what makes it worse is that it shouldn't be, given that India is a democracy, given that it has a legal system that has the same roots as our legal system does. Other questions? Yes, this one. Hi, thank you so much for um, coming out today. It's great to hear on India, um, that whereas, as you said, it's often clouded out by China. Um, my question is rather multifaceted. Um, I'm interested to hear what the current state of India's relationship with China is, and whether there's any, whether those two countries have any interest in developing further regional economic relations, and whether said relationship would be would threaten or or rival their relationships with Western countries, Australia, the yeah. U.S., etc. Thank you. The best I can say is that it's a very complex relationship. Let's remember that India has fought two wars with China. I think it's two, isn't it? Uh, one in 1962 over the Northeast and also in the Northwest along parts of Kashmir. Uh, 
so that's at the same time. It's a fought a war, and that that, that is the boundary changes that are still unresolved between China and India, that they have overlapping territorial claims which are unresolved. There's an awful lot of military activity in both countries and inevitably when, you know, as we see more dramatically in the Korean Peninsula, but when you, know, you have unresolved uh, wars and large build-up of military forces on either side of a contested boundary, you know, that's one potential flashpoint in the relationship. Another flashpoint from India's perspective is that India obviously has a very difficult relationship with Pakistan, which is you know, borderline being a failed state. And India knows that China arms Pakistan with nuclear weapons and with nuclear technology, and um, that China is building a naval base in, uh, what's the name of the port, Gwaidor or something like that in the southern part of Baluchistan, uh, which it may uh, seek to put vessels in that would threaten India's sense of security in its own region. Uh, so there are those kind of things. Uh, there are issues that stem from the fact that they have fundamentally different political systems. There are issues arising from the fact that India aligned itself with the Soviet Union during the Sino-Soviet split. And there are some legacies that still continue from there. Yes, they have some things in common as uh, newly emerging large economic and political powers. And when it comes to issues of trade negotiations, issues of the uh, to do with the fact that the institutional structure of the world economy, voting rights in the IMF, capital in the World Bank, the way in which the World Trade Organization negotiates, all reflect the world as it was in 1945 or 1950, not the world as it is in 2012. And China and India, along with Brazil and South Africa, have a common interest in seeking to change those things. So I think a summary, an imperfect summary, would be to say that China and India have common interests in changing the way in which the world economy works. They are economic rivals as well, which doesn't mean that they can't be friends in other areas, but it'll obviously inform the relationship between the two of them. But they are certainly potentially strategic and military rivals in their own region, and that's always going to make the relationship very, very complicated. And of course, they're coming at it from two fundamentally different political systems. One other observation which I'd make here that I think is important is that India has, since it became independent, been very wary of lining, of lining up too closely with any of the great powers. And, you know, again, there are understandable reasons born out of his, uh, India's history for that. And that, to some extent, makes India's strategic and diplomatic life harder as well, too, because if you're not you know, being aligned with other great powers or being the leader of an alliance of smaller countries, you know, involves responsibilities as well as privileges, uh, and some of those can involve you in difficult strategic choices. Uh, the fact that India likes to go it alone has some advantages in terms of India's freedom of movement, but also imposes some constraints on what it can achieve in its own interests or anybody else's acting alone. Yeah, time for one last question, uh, right up the back. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your very thoughtful and illuminating um, discussion. I had the pleasure of being to it and addressed by you in Moama, would you believe, in, oh, right. okay. in, in, yeah, yep. in the country. And you gave a, a, a speech that night on, basically on China, with a, you know, a little bit on the side. But um, my question is, what about the Indian currency? I noticed that there's been no mention of the Indian currency and the fact that the downfall in the trade with Australia in the past couple of years might be due to the Australian high rate in the dollar. That may well have had an impact. I mean, not only has the Australian dollar risen a lot uh, against most currencies, US dollar among others, but the rupee has fallen quite a bit. Uh, that's partly because India, unusually for an Asian country, runs very large trade deficits these days, and a fair bit of that is because India is almost wholly reliant on imported sources of energy, particularly crude oil and petroleum products. So. Uh, India's currency has fallen 
in part because of it, it's running a large current account deficit, not being able to cover it with foreign investment inflows as readily as, for example, we cover what is by our standards a fairly large current account deficit as well. Uh, so, yeah, I th that's a fair point that the appreciation of the Australian dollar against the US dollar, other currencies and the rupee would not have helped our agricultural and manufacturing exports. On the other hand, when it comes to coal and gold, which as I said, and copper for that matter, which account for over 80% of our exports, and I wish the trade relationship was more broadly based than that, but it isn't, uh, all of those commodities are priced in US dollars and the price is pretty homogeneous around the world. So I don't think that currency movements would have had a major impact on those three commodities which make up most of our exports in particular. Yeah. Yes. Just before I thank our orator, um, our esteemed head of college here has told me I must remind you all that the next major event on the International House calendar is Café International, which is on uh, uh, Saturday the, the 4th of May. And the students run the event. Uh, any profit goes to the students who use it uh, uh, for very worthy causes, both within but also without the college. So I understand, uh, Gemma, that there are people outside at a table uh, who have some tickets, I'm told. Uh, so if you'd like to buy a ticket tonight, uh, then, then you're most welcome to do that. Furthermore, after um, we complete this uh, session, if you want to stay and, and mingle and just uh, chat for a little while, uh, please do that. But it is uh, my uh, final great pleasure uh, to thank our orator Saul Eslake for what I think everyone will agree has been a most insightful and informative um, a report in a way and commentary on India. And although you haven't been there, Saul, uh, no doubt uh, one of these days you will, uh, but, but indeed um, uh, your, your overview has been truly outstanding and you've done us uh, exceedingly proud uh, to come to the college tonight and to make this presentation to uh, International House alumni and friends. So I ask you all uh, to thank our orator in the usual way and also then I just make a presentation to you as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.